Welcome everyone to the final round table for the Creative Health Review on leadership and strategy with a particular focus on embedding creative health into integrated care systems. All of our previous round tables are available to watch on YouTube. I'm Alex Coulter, the Director of the National Centre for Creative Health, and it's great to see so many of you here today. Over 200 people um, have signed up for the webinar. Please say who you are in chat, and we encourage you to share ideas and information via chat. We're in the Zoom webinar format, which means that we can't see our audience. Um, but if you could please put any questions you have for us in the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, rather than in the chat, it's easier, easier for us to track questions if they're in the Q&A box. And if you would like to ask your question to one of the panellists in particular, could you please say that with your question? If you have any technical co concerns, please put them in the chat and we will try and help. The National Centre for Creative Health and the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health and Wellbeing's Creative Health Review aims to highlight the potential for creative health to help tackle pressing issues in health and social care and more widely, including health inequalities and the additional challenges we face as we recover from COVID-19. We have a panel of commissioners with a wide breadth of expertise, and they will help us to translate the findings from the review into recommendations for policymakers to encourage and inform the development of a cross-governmental creative health strategy. We're very grateful to David Clayton Smith, who is going to chair this roundtable. David is a trustee of the National Centre for Creative Health, chair of the Kent Surrey Sussex Academic Health Science Network and joint chair of Dorset County Hospital, where I was the arts manager for 15 years, and of Dorset Healthcare University Trust, the mental health and community health provider for the county. Thanks, over to you, David. Alex, thank you very much for the introduction and welcome to, to you all. It's great. I hope we've got nearly the 200 that uh, signed up to, to join us this morning. I have uh, chaired a number of NHS boards over the last 13 or 14 years and has only recently taken up this joint chair role at Dorset County Hospital and Dorset Healthcare. And as Alex was saying, this is a district general hospital uh, working jointly with a community and mental health trust. So as we work with the third sector and with our local government colleagues, we're really, really aiming to improve the care for individuals, but also the care within the communities. And I have to say that, well, I don't have to say this, but I might say this because Alex was involved, but the hospital has a very long standing commitment to the visual arts. Um, within the hospital and around its grounds. So we have an interest too in the question, what is the role of creativity in a health crisis? The National Centre for Creative Health aims to help foster conditions for creative health to be integral to health, social care and wider systems. And in this session, we're going to hear from uh, leaders with experience of embedding creative health across health systems, communities and local authorities. They will help us understand how this is achieved and also the benefits of doing so. We'll also think about creative health and how it can strengthen systems in response to the challenges we currently face. And during the pandemic, many people turned to creativity to support their own health and well-being and that of their communities. In the second half of the session, and in support of Creativity and Wellbeing Week, we will ask our speakers to respond to the provocation, what is the role of creativity in a health crisis? And we're also keen to hear your thoughts on this. And we can add these to uh, the Q&A or the chat function, Q&A if you want to ask questions, chat function if you want to be making a statement. Uh, we may use this anonymously in our social media event to add to the creativity and well-being week conversation. But I'm joined this morning by a very uh, impressive uh, uh, panel or panelists um, who are going to uh, brief, brief spe uh, speak briefly uh, on. Oh, David, you've muted somehow. 
Sorry, I hope I wasn't muted. <laughs> okay, I hope you can hear me now. Apologies uh, for, that I became muted. So I wanted to introduce first uh, Tracy Beakley, who is Chief Executive of NHS Norfolk and Waverley Integrated Care Board. Tracy leads uh, Norfolk and Waverley Integrated Care Board and is also will be hosting one of the uh, NCCH Creative Associates. Um, she will update us on integration into healthcare systems and the opportunities this presents for creative health. So Tracy, over to you. Thank you so much, David, and hello, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here because actually, I, I think I've got quite an unusual perspective um, although there are 42 integrated care boards across the whole of the UK, I am the only chief exec who doesn't come from the NHS. So 16 months ago, I was working for the third sector. And I think that gives me quite an unusual um, view of how creative health can be implemented and, and the benefits as well and how wide ranging it is. I sat down to write some notes before this and thought, goodness, how am I going to get this into five minutes? But I'm going to give it a try. I think the first time I realised the power of creative health was in hospice care. So my background as chief exec of Hospice UK really grounded me in some of these benefits. And what I saw in hospices was the power of art, creativity, whether that's painting, whether it's poetry, whether it's getting people involved in, in ceramics. Almost the, the sad thing about this is people were discovering a skill that they had no idea they had until the last months or perhaps the last year of their life. But what you saw through that was it gave them the ability um, to, to talk about things or, or to bring out feelings that they couldn't verbalize. And that might be about a loss of control. It might be around um, sadness, fear and depression. But it was also a way of bringing together pre-grief counseling with families as well. And I remember a particularly powerful case study of um, a mother and son who were not reconciled at all, who'd fallen out 15 years before, and the mother was in bed and the son came to visit her and they built a small garden in a bowl together. They hadn't been able to talk or be in the same room 15 years, but they were able for half an hour to start building this garden without speaking. And then a conversation started and they started to break down some of those barriers and they were reconciled before the lady died. And I thought, how powerful is that in terms of an intervention? So we saw the power of arts for people undergoing palliative care, but also then started to realise the benefits wider than that. And we had an amazing presentation at a Hospice UK conference about the power of singing with people with dementia. And my granddad at the time had dementia. So that weekend I went home to visit him and I have my Apple music on my phone. And I just started looking up some of the songs we used to sing when we were younger, um, all his war songs and the things he used to love. And he started singing along and it wasn't just him. The other people in the room started singing along and it turned into this massive singing session, which was so joyous, lasted for about 45 minutes. And it just gave everyone in the room a buzz, but it was also a connection. It was a new connection for me and my granddad, but it was also a connection for all of those strangers in the room as well. And we felt like for those 45 minutes, we built a community. I also saw the power of creativity in the Dying Matters work that we did around bereavement and just trying to talk and verbalize about death and dying because we don't talk about it very much as a society. So the impact when we were able to put on plays as part of Dying Matters Week, when we were able to play songs that people had put together. Um, and when we opened it up, just, just the ideas coming out, the designer coffin competition, for example, really started to generate conversations in town centres. The idea of people talking about what they wanted to achieve in their uh, last year of life or or, or what, they, what, the, what their big thing was, their bucket list that they wanted to talk about, got, got people talking across the generations. So none of those things would have happened yet without creativity. But also I saw the impact that it had on staff training as well. So this was a, a completely new idea for me. Uh, I saw a play at St Gemma's Hospice about um, the late Dr Kate Granger 
and you'll remember her. She's the person who instigated the whole hello, my name is. So this is a doctor who became ill herself with cancer and realized how depersonalized healthcare was. So by putting a play together, uh, which her husband helped out with, this was able to be used as staff training to really show the impact of staff communication with patients and help to improve patient care. And if any of you haven't seen that and you're at the NHS Confed conference in June, that's going to be shown again. Um, and I'm looking at how we can bring that into the NHS. But just and I could talk for hours about this, just a couple of things I want to highlight that's, that are going on in Norfolk and Waveney. Um, we work with a great organisation called the Greenlight Trust. Um, and they have a forest school. So we talk in Norfolk about having a natural health service as well as the national health service. So this is pulling together people of all ages, learning new skills, getting out and about, um, building confidence and that sense of achievement, helping people get back into work or just helping people get back into social interaction and with mental health conditions as well. So they have some really great outcomes. And also um, a care farm that I visited in Lowestoft a few weeks ago called Pathways. Um, lots of these popping up, actually. But again, across the age group. And I loved the fact that somebody said to me, this is a community. It's not a place. Helping people out with all sorts of different issues. But the peer to peer support that people were working on as well, working with animals, working with the land, but also learning new skills they could take forward into life. So I'm going to pause there and basically say I'm a convert to this. I'm looking forward to hearing more and seeing what I can learn through this and really thinking about uh, 16 months into the job, how we can embed creativity and arts more into healthcare, because I'm convinced it makes such a massive difference, not just on prevention, actually, but on acute care as well. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you uh, very much. Some, some really, really lovely uh, stories there for us to uh, be thinking about as we run through this morning. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, our next panellist uh, I want to introduce is uh, Dr Jane Povey, who is a clinical lead for personalised care for NHS Shropshire, Telford and Rekin. Jane has been working with uh, NCCH to spread creative health in health systems across the country. And she'll tell us about the work, uh, how this work is progressing and how creative health aligns to the priorities uh, in the NHS. So, Jane, over to you. Thank you. Now, let's see if this works. The first one to try and get slides up. It's always a bit nerve wracking. Um, let me know. I'm just is that working? Is that good? Can we see? Yes. Yep. And can you see the full size screen slide? Yes. It's on. Uh, Perfect. Nice, Good start. Great. Lovely. Thanks. Well, hello. And um, thank you very much, David. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, it feels like a bit of a, a, a tipping point at the moment for our ability to embed creative health into integrated care systems. And I'll explain why um, in the next few minutes. I'm here on both on behalf of um, Shropshire Telford and Rekin Integrated Care System, who've been involved with um, the Creative Hub Health Hub programme for the last few years, but also with the work I'm doing with the Centre for Creative Health to spread and adopt and essentially riddle all of our health and care services with creative health opportunities. So um, firstly, this is, this is me really. Um, I came to Creative Health, um, very interesting hearing Tracy speaking, because I started off with, with my passion for music. You can see me playing the flute in the back of that orchestra. And um, throughout my childhood and adulthood, um, music has been very important to my well-being. <clears throat> I went on to become a GP, <coughs> excuse me, um, continue to enjoy my music. Um, but increasingly, I was seeing that it was often the um, other things than the medical things that um, were making more impact on the people that we were trying to look after and their families. So I had an increasing appetite for seeing whether I could combine creativity and being a doctor. Um, I also get frustrated easily. And where I could see quite early on in my career that the services that were being provided for people were neither very well meeting the needs of those people or those of us working in them. And I thought surely something more can be done. So I've had a hybrid career of practicing and doing leadership and management. And the fourth 
very pretty picture is actually Percy Thrower's Garden in the middle of Shrewsbury where I live. Um, it's just an example of how a little bit of creativity um, can brighten our days and the fact that communities are really important and the integrated care systems are a really exciting opportunity to be looking at the communities and the places that we serve as opposed to the routes through health and care serve pathways as we always like to talk about which really don't matter to people it's about them their own needs um, what matters to them what's happened to them and where they are and their home is so um just to uh bring you up to date on where we are at the national center for creative health um it, it, thanks to some huge support both from nhs england and arts council england um, the hub program which you may have heard of started um, a couple of years ago now and it was looking at four integrated care systems and exploring and sharing learning and developing a toolkit as to how emergent integrated care systems could embed creative health approaches and activities in all they do. Now you'll notice that integrated care boards didn't actually start till last year. So this was in the developmental phase and the four systems, two of whom were really advanced and able to share a lot of great practice. And we're gonna hear a bit more about West Yorkshire later um, and also Gloucestershire being the other one. And then ourselves in Shropshire, Telford and Recon and in Suffolk were incredibly enthusiastic, but not you know behind on the game it's itself. Um, the second year of this was more around trying to reach further into um, integrated care systems through the regions across NHS England. Um, and that was more about spread and adoption and enabling us to work with the newly formed integrated care boards, many of which were very different people and organisations from those that we have been working with in clinical commissioning groups. Um, and the very exciting thing that is literally launching now is the Arts Council England sponsored Creative Health Associate Programme. So Alex and I and others are involved currently in interviewing for seven posts. So we will have a Creative Health Associate in each of our English regions. Um, they will be based and sponsored by one of the integrated care boards so Tracy's hosting one which is great and we're going to have one in Shropshire as well um, and through that we're going to have a, a, a sort of learning network of the sponsors and the associates um, uh, managed by a coordinated by a program lead and that is a really exciting opportunity to build on what we're doing and sort of shine a light on the potential of creative health um, as integrated care systems um, start or move forward in tackling the many challenges they have but also realizing the opportunities that this um, approach has. Now the last couple of things I wanted to mention was a bit of food for thought or provocation for our discussions. This is not a formal diagram and this is my thinking which just shows you what goes on in my head really. Um, but essentially we've got a huge opportunity here. Thanks to Arts Council England and other funders, we're all able now to, I've, I've put it in the middle of it, our communities and places in a heart coloured um, central circle because that's what this is all about but we now have an opportunity with NHS England the National Association for Social Prescribing CHWA and NCCH um, to supported by um, working with the Department of Health and Social Care and other gov governmental departments really be able to shape policy, policy and implement the strategy which is intended to meet the needs in a person-centered way of everybody in our communities so um, I will have missed things out from this. This is uh, this is the first time I've shared this. So um, I would really welcome comments, but just trying to demonstrate the impact if we work strategically and collectively through cross-sector leadership of the impact we could have. And finally, so there are many challenges. Um, th there are more than this, but I've just highlighted a few here. So essentially, 
how are we going to shape the strategy and leadership, um, building on the great work that the APPG and the National Centre and others and partners have, have been doing over many years now. We know it works. Um, we, can, we can enjoy stories of the impact of creative health. Um, I think what as a collective, um, I suppose, social movement we've got here is a real ambition to scale this up and systemize the approach that we have to embedding creative health activities and approaches in our health and care systems. I know we're, I'm, I'm talking about an English programme, but we're hearing later from Wales as well, and this can apply wherever really. Um, so we have declining health and widening health inequalities as, um, as well described in Marmot's review of his, um, re more recent review of his work 10 years previously. Um, we have increasing, ever increasing pressure on health and care services for various reasons, including demographic, COVID and others, and limited resources. And that is both money, but also even if we have the money, often the workforce limitations are significant. Um, there are many wicked problems within different areas of care and health um, facing each system. The cultural sector is under pressure and the wider voluntary community sector is under pressure. And actually, creative health has a potential workforce that is in many ways untapped. So the opportunities are, as a determinant of health, creative health can ad help address these challenges. If we look through a person-centred preventative non-clinical first approach to everything we're doing, creative health can make a difference, including but not only through social prescribing. And I think this is an important one, that our workforce are exhausted. Our health care and creative workforce force are exhausted. And I think we can probably all personally advocate the fact that creativity can help mitigate that. Thank you. Uh, Jane, thank you very much indeed for um, sharing your story on our work and that marvellous kind of heart uh, coloured, as you described it, um, focus on uh, communities and places. And of course, the, the need as well as the desire to scale up uh, and address the uh, probably growing at the moment inequalities that we have in our health system. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to turn to Deborah Munt and, and Carol Massey uh, from the Ministry of Others, which is integrating creative health in West Yorkshire. So Deborah and Carol have been working with West Yorkshire Integrated Care Board, another of uh, NCCH's hubs, to investigate how creative health can grow and develop uh, in the region. And they'll provide an overview of their finding state. So uh, Deborah and Carol, let me hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> right, just bear with me. I'm just going to share my screen. Thanks. There we go. Thank you very much. So yes, um, I'm Deborah Munt from, uh, uh, from, from Ministry of Others, and we have been, myself and my colleague Carol, have been doing a piece of work in West Yorkshire. There we are. Uh, West Yorkshire is, um, is made up of five local authorities. That's Wakefield, Huddersfield, Bradford, Leeds and Calderdale. So uh, we were commissioned um, by the National Centre for Creative Health and the ICB to look at how might creative health um, grow and develop and upscale uh, uh, across the footprint. And one of the first things that we were very um, conscious of was how sort of fiercely independent each of those five places were. And so um, it felt really important to go through a process of conversations that were place-based, um, whereby we were looking for the assets um, in each place, as well as, of course, the challenges um, uh, for the work. Um, one of the things that we sort of noticed as we were starting to go through that was some really interesting um things that were happening in West Yorkshire that were actually around infrastructure we're used to sort of seeing the sort of projects um but infrastructure just sort of examples of how that was starting to 
to, to, to come up uh, bot bottom up. And actually that, that was starting to really kind of uh, make a more transformative difference. So that's really what we were starting to look at. And one of the things that we realized as we've gone through this process um, is, is that there are some things that, um, that, that need to happen in terms of how we think about the work, not just in terms then of what we do, so for me, the idea of a shift from the idea of, of, of creative health as something that's niche um, and just something that's delivered to something that's much broader in terms of this idea of creative mindsets and skill sets that um, need to be fostered within the entire system. Um, that actually there are a series of prejudices that we hold within our given sectors about um, how, you know, we have been conditioned to think about this work in a certain way, and it is useful for us to be challenging our thinking around that. Um, and also that potentially, um, if we think about how to develop and grow a sector, any other sector, you know, we sort of found that we're not necessarily applying that same thinking to this area of work. So, so why wouldn't we do that? It was just an interesting question. What we did is we kind of gathered information about the, the kind of good practice and the sort of infrastructure and the thoughts that people were having um, across West Yorkshire was just sort of pulled together this idea of what is the sort of ecosystem, the creative health ecosystem in a place. And this is not in any way exhaustive. We've still got to interrogate it and challenge it some more with some more people but we sort of started to think about this because it it in a way it's a useful lens through which to look at what the development needs um are, are, of a place are around uh creative health so we see it as a potentially uh useful tool i'm going to hand over to carol now yeah so in terms of this um, event, this this kind of presentation, we also wanted to talk quite kind of specifically about the the, the learning that we've got from from West Yorkshire in terms of what that means for leadership um, and what that means for all the organisations uh, that are involved in creative health. Um, and one of the things we really really wanted to um, stress today was that you know for for a good creative health. Uh, sector uh, to, to operate really well and to have an impact. Um, the success of that really does depend on all the kind of main partners uh, taking a leadership role. Um, and we've, we've kind of called that sort of collaborative or, or, or dis distrib distributed, if I can get the word out, um, leadership. But that's about everybody, so all the organisations involved, supporting the ambition, which, I mean, we, we're kind of looking in West Yorkshire that we have an articulated um, ambition for, for creative health, but, but it is about everybody kind of getting behind that ambition. Supporting the models, the thinking, and of course, um, very, very importantly, supporting the resourcing um, that, that needs to follow that. Um, so yes, that's very much about the NHS. Um, it is a system, and then we've heard um, already this morning about the fact that all parts of that system are important. So, you know, through from, you know, community prevention, health, health promotion, primary care, secondary care, mental health services. So all of those elements um, are kind of making a contribution and, and working on creative health and they're keen to do more work on creative health, but sometimes they don't know how, how to kind of go about it. So it is, the NHS is, is, a, is, a, is a huge organisation. Um, and, and we need to kind of find a way of, of, of involving all of those kind of elements of the NHS. But it's not just about the NHS. Um, we need leadership from the arts, culture and heritage sector as well, because a vibrant and, and, and supported arts and culture sector is, is absolutely fundamental um, to this work. Um, we've been really lucky in, in West Yorkshire in that we've got a, a, a Metro Mayor, um, Tracy Brabin, who has been hugely supportive um, of, of creative health work and is really, really keen to see how the, the kind of um, the areas that, that she's responsible for, if you like, and the areas that she has um, pots of money to help to support can contribute and, and, and support creative health. So thinking about things like business support, uh, pathways into jobs, skills development, um, 
but also things like transport, um, because one of the things we heard, um, and, and West Yorkshire is, is quite a small and very well connected area, but one of the things we heard from the work that, that we were doing um, is that, you know, if you can't actually get easy access both to healthcare services or to cultural services, you know, there's a, there's a fundamental um, access problem. Um, so social infrastructure, really, really important. Um, the third element um, of, of the kind of work that we've been doing has been about the, the support of, of universities and, and academics, uh, both in terms of action research, but innovation, the evidence base as well. So they're also a really, really important leader um, and partner uh, for us in, in Creative Health in, in West Yorkshire. And what that means for the, the, kind, the kind of leadership, if you like, that we would need um, would be that, that it's, it's a kind of generous, mature, uh, supportive and a kind of leaning in, stepping in kind of leadership. Um, so this was the diagram that we um, came up with uh, in, in terms of kind of trying to describe and, and set out what that, that tension looks like, because um, we think creative health is the kind of light bulb thing in the, in the middle of the diagram there, uh, supported by all of all of the, the kind of partners involved, but but the three sort of main sectors um, being uh, cultural, arts and heritage, health and social care, and and academic and and research. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and this is kind of what we are proposing to go forward with. We're working on how uh, on making this happen at the moment, which is to kind of have a an, an operational kind of creative health collaborative or hub that will be <clears throat> uh, well staffed. There will be a, a, a kind of creative health lead for each of the places in West Yorkshire um, who will, as you can see uh, on the right, then in a way kind of enable that, that kind of local, that place-based uh, ecosystem acting as a broker, a bridge, a connector, a, conven a convener, um, between all the different sort of stakeholders and, and um, uh, people involved at that place-based level. But equally and very important, it will have a set of West Yorkshire-wide functions and someone will lead on that as well. There's, there's, there's lots of stuff that needs to be nuanced and place-based, um, but there are plenty things that um, require critical mass and collective thinking um, and coalesced efforts. Um, and within that sort of central team, there would also be a big focus on um, uh, communications and marketing because visibility um, was one of the issues that came through really loud and clear constantly in this work. Um, part of that job has to be about changing the way people think about creative health, changing the way, how we think we need to invest in it. Um, sort of embolden, emboldening the sort of public consciousness around this work, um, uh, as well as the professional co consciousness around the work. Um, so that's that's where we're at at the moment. We've also been doing some work with the University of Huddersfield through their um, AHRC um, funding uh, around, which has looked more closely at inequalities um, and how all of this relates to su supporting that work in communities um, that, that need it most. But I think for us, in terms of that kind of uh, leadership um, and strategy, the, the kind of the takeaways are, are around um, challenging the way that we think about it or getting someone else to help you to do that. Um, investing in infrastructure because or capacity, whatever whatever that looks like, we seem to. I don't know how we've got to where we are as a sector, in terms of the scale that we're doing without that infrastructure. But for it to be more transformative and for it to achieve the potential that it really could, we really need to invest it, invest in that. And um, and that that key thing about the realization that um, it 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 operates. Its strength is that it operates in that space in between. So our leadership and our uh, and our work around that, the responsibility for this strategically, should also be about that space in between, and it should come from all of the different uh, sectors uh, involved. So that is where we are at at the moment. Uh, and Carol, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it's very 
interesting to me that this is you know it's not niche and you talk about mindset and skills and actually it's about making sure this is a grown-up activity that needs managing uh and obviously it's probably sort of brave and rather un unapologetic leadership but it's leadership across the whole system i think is what you were what were telling us there so that was a, a really helpful so the first three speakers we've heard from have, uh, have given the various kind of perspectives within the English system, but I'm delighted that we're joined by Nesta Lloyd-Jones, who's the Assistant Director um, of the Welsh uh, NHS Confederation. And in Wales, uh, partnerships between NHS Wales and the Arts Council have ensured that, arts, uh, that an arts and health coordinator is in post in each health board. So Nesta will tell us about how creative health has been integrated uh, to the healthcare systems in Wales. So Nesta, over to you, look forward to, to your story. Lovely, thank you very much, David. I'm really pleased to um, be able to, to attend today and provide a bit of a, a background, a bit of perspective from, um, from Wales. And uh, like others, this is a very small um, part of the story, I would say. And But first of all, I just want to give a little bit of background for those who don't know the, the structures uh, within um, Wales and, and the work that the Welsh NHS Confederation um, does. So the Welsh NHS Confederation is very lucky. Uh, we are the membership body that represents all 12 bodies that make up the NHS in Wales. Um, so as David said, we have um, seven health boards. Um, geographically, they're integrated um, health boards, so they provide acute and also community um, services uh, across Wales. And then we have national bodies, um, which are, are listed there, and also um, organisations leading on workforce and uh, digital. So for the about six years now, the Welsh NHS Confederation has worked you know, very, very closely with the Arts Council of Wales. Uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with the Arts Council of Wales, which was signed in 2018, which aims to establish a more strategic and integrated approach to arts and health at a national level. Um, the MOU has been very much more than a written agreement. Um, so we've, we've got two MOUs, the first one ran for three years, and then we, we looked at you know, what more can we do at a national level? And it's very much more than a written agreement on a, a shelf. It has really enabled us in Wales to take action together in partnership and has led to a, a, led to a lot of uh, practical and tangible things um, over the last uh, six years to respond to the current pressures and the previous pe uh, pressures that the healthcare system and um, the arts um, sector has faced. The partnership has been recently recognised in an article in The Lancet. Um, the article considered global pro progress on intersectoral approaches to realising the benefits of the arts, specifically for public health. In the scoping review of 172 relevant global policy documents, um, our MOU was regarded to be one of the most concrete commitments um, they have found, both in terms of intersectoral approaches and the specific investment uh, and action. So both myself, um, who leads on the work on behalf of the Welsh NHS um, Confederation and Sally Lewis at the Arts Council of Wales, you know, very proud to see that the work that we've been undertaking um, has really, you know, been recognised in that way. And I think one of the things, you know, both myself and, and Sally have been on this journey together, so others have mentioned partnership, and that has been key, I think, for both organisation um, that we've got, we've had two leads uh, within the individual organisations who have both been here since the very beginning. And so that relationship has, has been key. I think the other aspect has been the legislation in Wales. So it's been key um, with the introduction of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, uh, which was passed in 2014, 2015, sorry, has enabled national partnerships and cross-sector working and has helped frame the work and open doors for the arts within uh, with health partners and definitely vice versa as well. The Act is about improving the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales and gives a legally binding common purpose, so the seven well-being goals which can be seen on this slide. And those well-being goals include a healthier Wales and a Wales of vibrant culture. 
So for the government, NHS bodies and other specified public bodies, such as local authorities, we all have to comply with these wellbeing goals and have to highlight and evidence how we are complying and implementing the legislation. The legislation provides the framework to prioritise early intervention, prevention and considering the longer term, so not looking at the here and now and the current challenges in the NHS or in the, in the arts, but what can we do together in the longer term? And as a result of the Act, public bodies in Wales really need to consider the longer term impact of the decisions and the need to do things differently has definitely opened up new opportunities for both the arts and health providers. Another key uh, factor in Wales, and I know Jane um, gave an update in regards to what is happening in England, but I think one of the key factors has been, uh, as David mentioned, the arts and health coordinators. So all seven health boards in Wales have a coordinator in post and some have an arts and health team. And we are aware some of the uh, national NHS trusts in Wales are also looking at investing and developing coordinators within the, their organisations as well. The arts and health coordinators were introduced uh, from 2018 and are partly funded by the Arts Council of Wales and partly funded by individual health boards. The Arts Council consciously engaged with the health and care system at a strategic level because they wanted to work um, the work that they were doing to connect with and have buy-in from the very beginning with health, um, health partners and health commissioners. The arts and health coordinators have very much been a game changer in terms of embedding arts within the health system. And the coordinators understand and respond to the health priorities from the inside out. So they understand the challenges and the issues both for the NHS workforce, the partners that NHS organisations are working with, and then looking at how they can support both patients and staff and the wider population. We recently um, undertook or commissioned an evaluation of the arts and health coordinators programme, uh, and this slide provides a little bit of uh, the, the key factors that the evaluation highlighted. And the evaluation, uh, the independent evaluation highlighted that the arts and health coordinator programme has been very successful at a very relatively low cost intervention in stimulating and supporting the role of the arts in achieving positive health outcomes. And the outcomes have contributed to positive impacts, both on physical and mental health and well-being of patients, of staff, especially during the pandemic and the wider public around across a range of health and related functions. So both prevention, which others have highlighted today, mitigation, treatment and also key recovery. So one of the key uh, challenges at the moment in, in Wales and, and in other areas of the UK is around um, patients being discharged from hospital and the support that they need, whether it's rehab or others. So the arts and health coordinators have really supported um, how we can support patients and people to go back um, home. Coordinators have um, had the most impact when closely aligned with the health board's strategic objectives. So as others have mentioned, by working closely with health leaders, they've been able to move their work, shift their work, um, to work very closely uh, with the health board's priorities. A key aspect for the success is whether the departmental lead so the line manager values and champions the coordinator's role. But the part played by other champions and advocates across the organisation has also come out very strongly in the evaluation. And we are aware of a number of clinicians uh, and people working within the NHS have really seen the benefits and working very closely with the arts um, coordinators in regards to their areas of expertise. And they have provided a lot of support and energy and connection to the health board's mainstream work. So this modest investment has led to substantive and permanent posts being created in most health boards now. 
and the ambition has shifted from a single individual for uh, the arts and health team to sometimes talking about an arts and health service within the health boards. In relation to the future, the key aspect that the evaluation highlighted was how the NHS translate the value which they increasingly attribute to the arts and health work in meeting their own key priorities into a longer term and mainstream commitment in the NHS organisation strategic plans. So in Wales, the IMTPs, the integrated medium term plans, how can arts and health be a key aspect throughout that um, organisational plan? As well as the legislative framework, there has also been national support and government support, which is always um, key. Wales is a, a quite a small nation. We are very close to um, the politics as well. And I think one of the, the key aspects has been that the fact that our Minister for Health and Social Services is very committed to arts and health. And she herself established um, in the Welsh Parliament, the Arts and Health Cross-Party cross Group um, before prior to her becoming a minister. So she established that group for the first time. And we've also got a um, support from deputy ministers for mental health and well-being who understand and recognise the good practice um, between um, the NHS and the arts. So in conclusion, I think, as others have said, the size, the partnerships, the legislation, policy, and I guess the commitment across health and the arts has really enabled us in Wales to embed creative health across the system. There has been, I think, over the last you know, six years, a really clear evidence of a shift from a push from the arts to a pull from the NHS because the NHS can really see the health need and how creative solutions can respond to the current um, healthcare challenges. The vision going forward in the long term is there is a clear understanding that access to the arts and creativity are essential pillars of good health and well-being for all, where long-term thinking, equal partnership and ongoing learning are the norm and the arts and health is mainstream and an, an essential component of arts and, and social care delivery in Wales. And as Deborah mentioned, the, one of the key aspects of that is around evidence and research and innovation and learning from each other and sharing good practice. And again, by having seven coordinators in post who re meet regularly, they are able to share learning and provide peer support to each other uh, and have their own network, which, again, it, you know, is very, very um, key because it can be quite lonely if you're um, on your own uh, in very large organisations. Thank you very much. Jochen Vau. Nesta, thank you uh, very much for that. I bet there's a lot of colleagues in England thinking, hmm. It would be good, wouldn't it, if we had uh, uh, kind of embedded uh, in uh, in policy that need for vibrant cultures. Um, and so really interesting. Thank you very much indeed. And it's, of course, it was also interesting to hear that although you were describing um, a kind of the overall the strategic approach, there was also reference to that embedding of the arts, even in down to the process of uh, rehabilitation and that individual's return uh, to their homes. So scaling it back down uh, away from uh, policy to, to work on the ground. I'm really uh, pleased now to introduce uh, Shana Stansfield, who is a managing partner of Oxford Terrace and Rawling Road Medical Group. And in her role as a primary care network manager in Gateshead, uh, Shana has worked closely with the community to develop creative opportunities which have improved health and well-being. So she will give us some detail about how that has been achieved right down at a community level. So over to you, Shana. Hi, thank you very much, David. 
Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be with you here today. So my day job is a practice manager. Um, and as a practice manager, we feel that being creative and engaging with the arts is absolutely essential if we're going to deal with the healthcare crisis. Um, it's not a choice for us. It's essential if we're actually to survive, thrive and grow. And in my practice, what we've done is actually um, turned the burning platform into a burning ambition of um, engaging with, uh, with creativity to, to meet the crisis. Why? Well, the reason why was that I became a practice manager in 2008. At that time, we actually achieved, we used to get 11% of GDP. Over the years, that's reduced down to 8%. As the funding has reduced, people's needs have become more complex. Demand on general practice has increased. Poverty deprivation is now compounded by food and fuel poverty. All of that has over the years become exacerbated by Brexit, by COVID, and by the cost of living rises. And the past three years have been more challenging than ever, than ever. And what I find is, is that my waiting room is full of people with a social need impacting their health. And as a general practice, that's challenging for us to meet. And actually, that means we've had to be so much more creative because we have, be, we have to actually deal uh, with 21st century problems, not with 19th century solutions. And that requires disruptive leadership. It requires breaking the rules disrupting the status quo, enabling a culture that actually enables disruptive innovation and creativity. And what we've done in the practice is use quality improvement science to measure the journey, to measure everything that we, that we do. And I'll share two examples with you. So we've completely redesigned our workforce around population need. We've met with communities and patients in the liminal space. And Emily has asked that question, you know, how do you co-produce um, with others? And the liminal space, basically what that means is, is that we as statutory organizations live on the land, which is very high, highly governed, which is really, really hard with regard to rules. And our patients and communities, they actually live in the sea, which is much softer, it's more pliable and, and more flexible. What we have to do is actually meet on the sand, where we actually have a recognition of each of those rules and each of those constraints, but actually share them. And by sharing them, we actually meet the problems together. And I'll, I'll share an example of, of that with you. Um, the other thing is we've developed patients who are volunteers in the practice and I'll just quickly share three examples with you. The first example is, is so the GP contract now requires us to, um, to measure demand. In my practice, we've been measuring demand since 2015. When we started to measure demand, we actually found that many people who were coming to the practice had a social need, not a health need. And we found the majority of our patients were frail elderly patients living in their own homes with comorbidity, and this was in 2015. So what we'd, we'd done some work around um, um, demanding capacity and two nurses left because they didn't want to work in an environment that was going to be different. We used the funding that we, um, um, we um, saved, which was £54,000, to employ a frailty nurse. When we interviewed the frailty nurse, because in general practice, we don't have the skills for comprehensive geriatric assessments. When we interviewed Karen, Karen said, you know, one of my weaknesses is that I've never worked in general practice. And we said to her, actually, that's a real strength because we need to look at these problems with fresh eyes. We need to use quality improvement tools. And actually what you're bringing is all of that knowledge around comprehensive geriatric assessment that we just don't have in general practice and we have still not able to get. So Karen started working working um, with, with frail um, um, elderly patients who were housebound, who didn't meet the community nurses criteria. And within six months of starting her role, she reduced home visits by 81% because she was taking a personalized care planning approach and we reduced attendances to admissions by 54%. So we've employed Karen and we employed two frailty nurses in the practice to do that work because we find that proactive management of people who are complex actually works better and that you can you can measure that that impact. But when after six months we looked at Karen's caseload, we found 50% of the people on her caseload were people with a social need and they didn't need her, her um, skills. So we developed something called a care navigator. And that care navigator has now ended up as a social prescribing link worker that you see in the PCN contracts. I'm not every practice now has um, a, a, a social prescribing link worker in, in, in the practice. But when we started with, with Jane and Julie, they were both receptionists. And I said, we're going to start doing some work around care navigation. And they said, what does that mean? And they said, I haven't got a clue, but we're going to use quality improvement tools to learn. And we're going to start with dementia. So in a period of three months, when we first started, we identified patients, uh, six, um, 86 patients with dementia. And of those 86 patients in that three month period, they were all managed through social prescribing, not one needed to see a doctor or a nurse. And we also at the same time reduced um, admissions and attendances to A&E and we managed to su support carers. That leads on to the next part of my story. So we found that we had many, many people during COVID 
who weren't registering as carers because many people don't want to be paid to be carers. But what we were saying was actually you need to be registered so we can give you your COVID vaccinations. So during COVID, I started to go out and we, we'd always connected with third sector organizations. We have a very dynamic directory of services that we connect with. Um, and um, I went to meet Gates of Carers. Now I'm a gardener and, and it's a passion of mine. And when I met, went to meet with Gates of Carers, what they said was they had an allotment and they didn't know what to do with this allotment and the allotment had actually lain follow, follow for eight, eight years. I then went to meet with an organization called Best of Bencham and we needed to connect with, with people who are at high risk of COVID to actually get them registered, people in mosques and um, in, in synagogues and things. Um, and the, the, um, the allotment was actually, was um, gifted to Best of Bencham. Um, and uh, Bess Benjamin didn't know what to do. And I said, well, leave it with me and, and I'll, I'll see what I can do. I came back to the practice. Uh, we weren't able to actually have our Christmas night out that year. So we gave the money to the allotment. That allotment has now flourished into an, um, a CIC. So patients are now running the allotment and we refer patients to the allotment. And Julie, who's one of the social prescribing link work often rings me and she'll say, I'm sitting here with a patient doing this, that and the other. And actually she rang me one day and she said, I'm sitting here with a patient who's got really severe mental health problems. And he's teaching me how to make um, fertilizer out of nettles. So working with patients, um, having different conversations with patients is really, really important. Um, and over this time, I was admitted into hospital as an emergency. And whilst I was in hospital, there were lots of patients who didn't want to go home for Christmas because they had nobody to go home to. And relatives were fighting to take patients home for Christmas because if they took them home for Christmas, then if they were admitted again, they would be sitting on a trolley for, for, for days on end. So when, eventually when I got back to work, I said to my GPs, we're going to start cooking Christmas dinner for patients on Christmas Day. The imperative for me was to reduce attendances and admissions to A&E. But what we decided was we would develop patients as volunteers. So we have challenges in, in, in having patients to, um, attending our PGP. But when we opened up our, um, um, our practice to volunteers, there were 19 people with severe mental health problems who decided to become volunteers. One of those patients, T, who was really debilitated with schizophrenia, couldn't speak, uh, became a volunteer. In May that year, uh, in, in March that year, we actually we did a merger and I went down to, to look at the other site and there were some amazing posters and cakes and T had made these posters and cakes and she was so creative. Um, and then she came to see me in September and she was speaking now and she said, Mrs. S, she said, um, I've, I've got myself a catering qualification. I'm going to cook your Christmas dinner for you. So since then, she has been cooking Christmas dinner every year, and she uh, then took over running an organization called um, Gateshead Clubhouse. Now, Gateshead Clubhouse was run by Gateshead Mind. They lost their funding. So T got together nine patients with severe mental health problems. They set up a steering group, and now they run Gateshead Clubhouse, and all of the patients who would normally be sitting here in my practice go to the clubhouse for their support. It opens every day. The only day it's closed is New Year's Day. And we've developed patients in the practice who are volunteers, so we do need matter classes. We've just started a project with bees because um, we now have a second allotment. And we are really quite keen to actually preserve our environment. And we've started to work with um, um, the Horticultural Society and they've given us a small fund. So, and we're working with this lady called uh, Barbara Keating, who is a bee um, artist. So she now comes into the practice and she teaches people about bees. And we've learned that actually um, in the country, there are 225 different species of bees and 33 species actually live in Bencham where my practice is. So what we're doing with the two allotments is we're actually going, we're going to be growing an, an orchard. We're going to actually make all the community, serve, community environment um, bee friendly meadows. But patients, well, people are really isolated. So we've started to run a walking group. So people who come along to walk, they will walk with Barbara. Barbara teaches them about bees, she teaches them about, about insects. And we're, we're actually, I've just developed a new building here in, um, in Bencham. Uh, we've got a new GP practice that we built during COVID. And the whole of the environment in Bencham is going to be bee friendly and insect friendly. And for me, by being creative, creative in that way, we're managing demand. We're growing, we're surviving, and we're thriving. And what we're doing is actually working with communities in a very, very different way. Thank you. Shane, as you, you started talking about burning ambition, I'm not sure that really covers the uh, kind of energy and drive and creativity that you're describing there amongst you and your, your colleagues from allotments to cooking to bees to walking. But the interesting thing is uh, giving uh, people who in a, were relying upon coming to the surgery really on a, a regular basis, a sense of 
uh, kind of purpose uh, and uh, and hopefully joy in terms of what they're providing for uh, colleagues in the community. So that was really, really helpful. Thank you very much indeed. So we've talked about uh, a lot of speakers have been involved directly with the health services in various different roles. But now I want to move to Marana, uh, who's director of the Lived Experience Network. So Marana is a director of the Lived Experience Network. And this network of people who believe in the benefits of creative and cultural engagement to individual and collective well-being. So Mar will talk to us about the role of lived experience in embedding embedding creative health into systems. So Mar, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, as um, David's mentioned, I'm one of the directors of the lived experience um, network, but until um, 2020, I was a dementia carer and I used to craft and I use crafting rather as part of my sort of daily dementia care with my mother. Um, but it was often my mother who taught me new craft skill because there was this embodied experiential and expert skill knowledge that she was able to access and use even into having late stage um, stages of dementia. Um, so I, I wanted to um, kind of um, start with this quote from um, Plato, because I've, I've used it before and I, and I think it's a, it's a nice short quote. Um, he says, the highest form of knowledge is empathy, for it requires us to suspend our egos and live in an other's world. And I've led with this quote because this perspective taken of living in another person's world is central to the connection that empathy has with creativity. And organizations like The Lens give voice to experiences and lives that might otherwise be hidden. So I'll start off with giving a bit of a background about the Lived Experience Network, also known as The Lens. Um, and apologies for some of you who might already know this, but very briefly, um, The Lens was set up as one of the recommendations from the uh, 2017 Creative Health Report published by the All Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health and Wellbeing. And a bit later, after my presentation, I'll put our email in the chat. Um, but at the lens, we know from first-hand experience that people can improve their well-being and transform their lives through taking part in creativity and culture. Uh, so we are a network of people with lived experience of ill health who share personal testimony of, of the benefits of taking part in creativity and culture to improve health, well-being, and emotional resilience. And as well as giving voice to experiences and lives that might otherwise be hidden, we actively advocate for the easy and fair access for everybody to participate in creativity and cultural opportunities at all stages of life. So we have Lens Champions um, located in nine regions across England. And we also act as a conduit to share and promote examples of good grassroots practice with organizations involved in developing national policy and research. But it's also important to see ourselves, people with lived experience and mirrored in the membership of, the organ of these organizations that develop and lead on research and policy. Um, so our vision, as well as like uh, everybody here on this panel, is that creativity in culture returns to being seen as an invaluable asset in health and social care. And this isn't new thinking. And an image that often springs to my mind is of, um, uh, there's a black and white photograph that is easy to find uh, uh, on the internet of recuperating um, soldiers knitting in hospital wards um, back in the early 1900s. So this isn't anything new. We've somehow just lost it, uh, but we need to find it and kind of embed it or bring it back um, to the forefront of how we think about um, health and social care or what it looks like from the outside and what it feels like. Um, so the lens works um, closely in partnership with the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance and the National Centre for Creative Health. Um, towards this vision that you know, every member of society has fair access to these types of um, opportunities um, that is vital to individual well-being, but also civic wellness. Um, so people who have used creativity to address their own unmet health and social needs 
and have a nuanced understanding of what are often complex needs. And complex needs and even basic needs are experienced differently by different groups. And the expertise that voices of lived experience can bring to how creativity is integrated into health and social care stems from valuing the importance of agency and empathy and how it affects how we see ourselves, our sense of self, but also how others see us, especially when agency is taken away from us. Words, as well as images and attitudes are important. For example, the word patient comes from the Latin word to suffer or the sufferer. The identity of being a patient has traditionally occupied the passive subject who is a recipient of expert care from another. This means that the patient's body is an object of legitimate interest to the healthcare professional, and it can be exposed and touched and sometimes invaded um, uh, legitimately in the process of treatment. And historically, the idea of active participation from the, from the person who is unwell has not always sat comfortably within this binary relationship of passive subject and expert professional, but this is changing as we've already heard in some of the presentations today. And being creative is about problem solving. It's about innovation and imagination and solving problems and being innovative and being uh, imaginative are agentic, agentic actions. It makes us feel agentic, it, it brings us agency. So any creative task or activity, no matter how small or how big, I was thinking last week, I, I dropped a, a stitch in a pair of socks I was knitting and I managed to fix it, fix it. And I can't believe you the sense of, I don't know, in, in, my, kind of in my head, I felt very proud, even though I was just kind of fixing a drop stitch. But all the kind of the small tasks, even to a big task, it needs planning and focused attention to overcome obstacles, again, no matter how small or how big, to reach that goal. Again, no matter how small or how big. So caring is experiential, it's problem solving, it's agentic, it's caring, it's empathetic, it's about having choices, it's about acceptance, it's about belonging, it's about flow, being in the moment. So creativity is not an additional extra, it's essential for being well and staying well. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much there. The uh, sort of living in uh, others' world and uh, empathy, interesting, and, and also this sort of encouraging thing about individuals becoming more active uh, participants. So thank you very much for that. Well, now the last speaker uh, this morning is Matthew uh, Cooper, co-director of the London Arts and Health. So as well as his role as co-director, Matthew has many years' experience uh, as a creative program director and is also currently working with the GLA, the Greater London Authority. And he's going to tell us um, a bit about his work. Matthew, over to you. Hi, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I would like to start off by wishing you all a very happy Creativity and Wellbeing Week. Um, it runs for this week from the 15th of May to the 21st. Um, I had a presentation put together, but uh, hearing you all, I've decided to drop that and just ramble. So uh, you will excuse me if I go off on a tangent a bit. But I'm here, as rightly as to say, as the, as the co-director of London Arts and Health and also as a creative health lead at the Greater London Authority. And I've been working in the cultural sector since, uh, since the late 90s, mainly in local government. Um, I started at Lewisham and it was here when I first discovered um, creative health through an evidence report done by the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, which showed that arts can have a benefit on people's lives. They tried different art forms across the hospital, music, uh, dance and visual arts to help people with physical and mental ill health. Um, and it worked. The evidence, there was an evidence that there was a report that came out and it worked. And I can say that after more than 20 years since I was first introduced to creative health and the numerous evaluation reports, it still works. This was very, this um, research was really transformative for me and I've been an advocate for creative health ever since. Uh, when I first became the director of, of Deptford X in 2006, which is a visual arts festival in South East London, we ran projects with young people using art to explore mental health, which produced some amazing work and was a real eye opener. 
mainly that we needed to ensure that we had the right support in place for young people. Um, something that we've been working on at the GLA when uh, right now, and we produced a, and there was a project produced last year called 2.8 million minds, um, and they produced a manifesto, which you should look at. And I'll put all these links in the chat. Um, Following that, I, wor I, wor I worked at Futures Theatre, which is a, a feminist theatre company. I was there as the um, just sort of like development director. Um, and I encountered that lots of wonderful work that they were doing there. They And they ran this amazing piece of work, a multi-art form project for women working in street prostitution. Um, this work changed lives um, and it allowed participants to get the help and support they needed and it wouldn't have happened without the without the work of Futures Theatre Company going out into the streets of finding people um, and introducing them to new to new art forms. So they were able to um, share their experiences through um, photography, through poetry, and and there was an amazing uh, piece of work that was a script that was put together as well. When I moved on to Arts Network, I worked with people with severe and enduring mental ill health. Again, I could see how creative. Health Creative health could support those most in need and provide a safe and creative space for people to, to meet and build relationships. It was, for some people, it was the only time that they were able to get out of their houses and do something and not be seen as a patient, but actually as an artist. And that was really, really important. Um, during the pandemic, um, whilst I was at Arts Network, I set up a, a mini uh, national network of similar small scale. Um, Creative, creative mental health um, providers, and we would meet on a on a on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, throughout throughout the pandemic, to share ideas, best practice, um, and what was and what was most important is we were there to support one another, and this was this was really key because a lot of the organisations, and I noticed that there's a few people here today, um, were just single artists or very small organisations. And they needed that support. They needed to. They needed to work together. And I'm, I'm delighted that I, I've left there, and that network is still going on. They're still there, meeting and supporting one another. And and that these are people. These organisations from Cornwall all the way up to all the way up to Durham and, and in between. All of this work has taken to where I am now um, at the GLA, working on creative health programmes, and as the co-director of London Arts and Health. Now, London Arts and Health supports artists, creative practitioners and health, practi and health professionals across London, promoting excellence and engagement in the field of arts and well-being and extending the reach of the arts communities and individuals who would rather otherwise be excluded. The vision is that power of arts and culture transform and enriches Londoners' lives and health. Um, we connect with over 23,000 people through very proactive social media. And actually, fact, if you follow us on Twitter or Instagram, You'll see that we're posting out on a very regular basis and we also have a very extensive newsletter sharing uh, opportunities um, jobs and training and funding opportunities um, we run networking meetings and, and and as i was saying training we are running a program at the moment for um, artists for the global majority with mental ill health supporting supporting their career development which will include um, them actually going into um, hospital settings as well um, and we're auditing a creative health we're auditing creative health provision across um, across the capital as well we're auditing we're mapping the mappers if you like because there's a lot of mapping that's going on across the uh, across the capital we're trying to find out who's actually doing that who's actually doing that mapping. and as I mentioned last night we uh, we launched um, creativity and well-being week which was fantastic we had presentations from Professor Kevin Fenton uh, the wonderful Professor Marion Lynch, um, please find out about her work, um, which is incredible, and a, and a reading by uh, Michael Rosen, um, which was both heartwarming and heartbreaking, um, and an incredible story of surviving the, uh, the pandemic. Um, throughout the Creativity and Wellbeing Week, there's, there we have a mixture of curated and regional events across the country. You can find out more on our website. I'll put it in the chat. It's creativityandwellbeing.org.uk. Um, then at the Greater London Authority, with my other hat on, uh, we've been very inspired by the Manchester Creative Health City, and we're running a series of design sprints looking at how we can do a creative health, uh, health action plan for London, which will lead to an unconference 
uh, in, in November where we'll be sharing information. The other thing we're looking to do is how can we really embed creative health into the integrated care system? Um, and we're working on a pilot project with the South East London ICS. Um, and actually, fact, today we are running a series of interviews, which unfortunately I'm not sitting on that panel. Um, and we're going to be working with the NCCH on their creative health associates, making sure that we're, work we're not working in isolation, making sure that we're sharing best practice and, and information. And then uh, finally, I just want to finish on a story that I'm stealing from the brilliant poet RJ Manupilla, who, is, who finished off our conference last night. He was, he was recently on the 172 bus. When someone tugged his shirt, he span round and saw a woman in a wheelchair said, who said, Arja, how are you? When are you coming back to do that drama course? Arja was flummoxed. He couldn't remember who this woman was or what on earth the drama course was. It was weeks later it dawned on him that this was a drama class that happened almost 10 years ago. Um, and this, this work had stayed with the participant for 10 years. And the unfortunate thing is that this project wasn't recommissioned. We don't know what art project that she'd been doing since. So we know that we know that creative health works. It needs support. It needs advocacy and it needs ongoing funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, very much for that. What a lovely uh, reframing, uh, not a patient, but an artist. Uh, and I think that's uh, great. So that has been a wonderful, has it, rich kind of series of perspectives um, around this topic. We're running a wee bit late, but I, we're going to take a short break. Uh, so if we could come back just after 20 past uh, 11, and then uh, we'll work through uh, the remainder of our programme with our panel discussion. So a um, couple of minutes break, probably uh, five, six minutes. Um, and if anybody wants to on the panel, turn off their cameras and we'll be back then. Thank you very much. Hang on a second. So, um, we talked and Matthew referred to uh, this week as Creativity and Wellbeing Week. And uh, the festival is kind of asking the question, what is the role for of creativity in the health crisis? And shortly we'll be asking our, our panelists to discuss the question. Now we're a little bit compressed on time, but we'll, we'll run through that. But first though, uh, to introduce the second half of a session, we're very pleased to be joined by surfing sofas and during the creative health review we've commissioned artists with their own experience of the topics we've covered to respond creativity creative creatively forgive me for these roundtable uh, themes and we will be releasing these in the build-up to the launch but we're very pleased to say that so surfing sofas the sofa surfer who writes uh, to break the stigma around homelessness and raise awareness about UK homelessness crisis is going to perform for us today. So uh, in response to the question, what is the role of creativity in health crisis? Over to you, Sofa Surfer or Surfing Sofas. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you all. Great things said by all the speakers this morning. Although my screen was off, um, I was listening and taking notes. So I've got a fever today and I've been rolling through this toilet roll. And I'm sure you don't want to see me blowing my nose every two seconds. But okay, let's move along with some poetry. Um, this poem is quite long, so apologies if I put anyone to sleep. And okay, let's begin. They say good leaders should have commitment and initiative, critical thinking skills and the vision to envision with. Now, you can be born a leader, a good one, but you can't be born a great one because great leaders are swords which are forged in the fires of compassion, failure, and experience. They say good strategy should have clear definitions, long-term goals and good gears in its systems. Strategies without compassion are good for the short term. However, we've seen many times in the long term they're inefficient. 
for decades, some leaders kept their failing strategies the same. But is a strategy a strategy without capacity to change? With good leadership and strategy, magic can happen. But that only happens when there's no lack of compassion. The best leaders I've met were brave, peaceful, and gentle. Their benevol benevolent traits are what I wish more can use. I'm not saying compassion is the be all and end all, but it should be prioritized in our list of core values. So let's maybe embed more compassion into strategy and leadership and art. Let's not forget art because we're practically in need of it. I mean, when my depression eats my joy and leaves me hungry for happiness, please don't offer to feed me with a platter of pills. Instead, feed me poems of solace by Longfellow and Wordsworth. Feed me paintings of hope by David Tovey and John Pierre. Feed me stories of overcoming by Denise Harrison and feed me photos of faith by Mitchell Sini and Amanda Sinclair. Feed me eco-friendly sculptures by Benji Lane and feed me play scripts I resonate with by Lisa Ogan. Feed me fashion from the future by Benji Spear and feed me songs of strength by Shalia. But please don't feed me too much meds when I'm down. But please, please do feed me as much art as you like. Which brings us to the question, what is art and creativity's role in a health crisis? Well, Arthur Rimbaud, a now French poet, created rich, heartfelt art while fighting poor mental health. And Vincent van Gogh, I'm sure you know who he is. If he never painted whilst being a mental, mental health patient, then we may have lost him much sooner than we did. There are phases when our minds can get overcrowded till we try to organize our thoughts but can't find space or the time to gather our thoughts. But when we make art, the process can put us in a trance-like state. It's like a meditative space where we seem to find we have lower blood pressure levels or some peace of mind. Art can also give people a dopamine boost that can help chase away those low and bleak moods. Art can break language barriers. For example, if I was to say the word fiore, you may not know what that means. But I bet if I was to doodle a flower, you see the translative magic of art and its beautiful power. Art is good at sparking the stuff that is causing a joy inducing, pain reducing, rush of endorphins. Creating art does something mysterious to the brain where it helps us reduce the experience of our pain. There's been some interesting research and what it suggests is that depression could slow down the healing of our wounds due to its psychoimmunologic effects. Well, art could shift our attention so that we're not as depressed, which seems to mean that art can benefit and ease the progress, the mindset and speed of a patient's healing process because art is a magician and wonder is this game. And we can feel the thoughts of happiness it conjures in the brain. This isn't complicated knowledge, so I must keep it simplified. Art can provide us with a much needed stimuli. It can make us stand and smile. It can make us sit and cry and help us greatly when we see a health crisis arise. Thank you. Now I need to blow my nose again. <laughs> Good for you. That was uh, delightful. Thank you very much. And the number of hearts I can see sending up screen uh, surfing service so just shows uh, how much uh, people react to the idea of when you're hungry for happiness. It's not pills, but it's the arts. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. Right. Well, I'm going to pull the panel together uh, again to... Uh, address this question about the role of creativity, uh, creativity in the health crisis. And I guess we've probably got no more than 20 minutes. Uh, so we're going to have to be quite compressed. Could I maybe suggest that when you debate this or go around it, there are quite a few questions coming in. Some of them are quite kind of practical, which is, so what are the challenges about getting alignment and collaboration so that the wonderful things that you've described can happen is how do we build in commissioning for people who do this a real sense of partnership to come through? So 
maybe, and I'm forgive me, but I'm not trying to to create your answers, but perhaps we can pick up some of the sentiment of these uh, questions as we go forward. So uh, there we are with the, the question, and I think perhaps it's going to work best if you put hands up and, and I can uh, introduce you if it isn't too kind of uh, stultified uh, doing that. So who would like to be the first to address that role of creativity in the health crisis? Do I see a hand? It's like being an auctioneer, really. Do I see a hand? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to pick on anybody, but I might. <laughs> if it's there. Matthew, thank you very much for raising your hand. Let's hear from you. I, I just felt I had to, I mean, as it's Creativity and Wellbeing Week, and it was our provocation. I feel I have to jump, I have to jump in. But first I want to say, Surfing Sobers, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I think what the one thing I'm, I'm I worry about with this is that we need to make sure that um we are working collaboratively with our with the partners in in health um and to understand that they are burnt out they go they're going through a, a really a really tough time so we need to so the first thing is, is we need to make sure that we work as allies and we're not a we're not a burden and we're there to, and we're there to support um but i mean as as i've as i've said before we are we're aware that creative health works um, so, and we need to be able to to share that story with um, with health with health providers. So I think that's a that's a big that's a big thing. That's a that's a starting point. Making sure that we work as allies, making sure that we can share um, what we what we can do, I think is a is a, is a really important start. Um, yeah, that's that's where I'm going to go. We're here to help alle alleviate the pressure. Thank you very much for that. Oh, let's go to Jane and then to Nesta. Nesta was hit me to the <laughs> well, you, you don't have to fight. We're, we're working as allies here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think somebody's asked the question about co production. And I think if we understood what we meant by that and did it really effectively, we'd probably be quite a lot further along. Um, we've heard from Yorkshire and from Wales, and they are much further ahead in being able to embed with the infrastructure, ecosystem, whatever you, framework, whatever you want to call it. Um, but actually, if we look at what our, I think there's two sides of this, looking at what our communities need and use creativity to, in a much more meaningful way, and I can say this as a GP, than we have in health previously, um, engage in understanding need and the, the communities that aren't well served at the moment and then build services around that understanding, wrapping non-clinical and then clinical service around that. We have a completely different world from the traditional commissioning provider um, perspective that the cultural sectors often had to tolerate. Um, so I would suggest that we get in there. I think it's quite right about understanding the pain and the pressures of health. And if we can demonstrate we're solving the wicked problems, we will be very well welcomed. And I'm saying we, as in the cultural sector, but I suppose I'm sitting one leg in one bit and one leg in the other. So I think that's the solution. Not that it's easy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Nesta. Thank you. Uh, it's just linking to, to what Matthew just said, actually, around um, the staff within the NHS. I think, you know, having the burnout, the well-being of staff is key. And I think NHS leaders can really see how the arts and, and creativity can really support their staff. So, you know, the NHS in Wales is the biggest employer, same across the UK. And I think the Arts Council of Wales have worked very closely with ourselves and um, leading national workforce organisations to develop um, creative tools for the for staff uh, and they've done that through um, a platform called cultural coach so it's um I'll, I'll put it in the in the chat but that can be used by staff but also wider members of the public and, and looking at other um people who you know who just want bite-sized things um that can you know, highlight how creativity can support their well-being. And a lot of the, the creativity that have been showcased there are also in the outdoors as well. So it's kind of, and, and also um, how they can do with their family members. So it's making it a more inclusive um, form of 
you know, supporting people when they, you know, have had a very, very challenging shift or, you know, challenging work, that they can go home and do things with family members that are creative to, to you know, support their, support their well-being. And I think, you know, do it specifically during the pandemic, um, the, the arts had to be more creative in regards to how to make it accessible. And not everything is accessible online. But being able to have virtual choirs, virtual orchestras, virtual dance groups enable people to access something. So even though many people were lonely and isolated, there was something for people to look forward to and to access every week. And a lot of that has then been developed further and embedded further. Um, so you know, the reach has probably been been wider uh, as well due to the fact that things have been made uh, available online. Yeah, thanks. For that. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how, how um, and Deborah, I was, I think, really pleased your hands up because I was going to ask you a question, but it was, it was just the, the, the thought that uh, moving towards creative health isn't so much getting permission to do something different. It seems to be about co-creating the things that we can do to support people. But uh, Deborah, let's, let, let me bring you in for your contribution. Um, yeah, I was just, it was, it was interesting when that um, question about the role of creativity in a health crisis, you can, came up, you, you know, you can answer that question about what does that mean for the individual and I can't do a better job of answering that than Surfing Sofas has just done. And, and that in itself is, is very telling about the power of creativity in this. But I think you can also answer that question in terms of thinking about why it's important for this for a system uh, as, as a whole. I mean, and it's and that has been uh, come up in some of the, com the presentations today about the importance of disruption and innovation and the ability to be able to be agile and flex and and work differently you know we have you know typically we have a, a health system that was was set up to do this amazing thing but what it was set up to do is very different uh, we're in a very, very different society to now, and we've got used to the idea of a certain skill set and mindset within within health systems in particular. Um, but that spectrum of of set of skill sets is kind of not not big enough now because the, what we have to deal with is much more much more complex. And I think that you know the culture sector has a lot of those kind of behaviors and mindsets and skill sets in abundance. But also for me, the job of the bringing together of this is, is the effect of contagion, is that within the health um, and care system are so many individuals who are just bursting to be creative in their work, but haven't necessarily operated in very permissive ground for that in the past. So part of this whole thing, and perhaps it you know also answers that that question is that the 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 greater that that contagion and that permissiveness of over time um the more we will be able to move towards each other in in, in developing those those co-productive pr produced responses that are truly responsive to the needs of the communities that that we serve Thanks, Deborah. It's, it's interesting uh, on the chat. There's one or two uh, comments coming up from people who do work with people who work in the NHS to, to support them. One question that uh, came up uh, uh, in the Q and A box is: Will we get to a time when the the term creative health is seen really as a transitional term? I mean, if we can make this all work, do, does the panel think? that we're going to go, yeah, that was the point at which we began to to use, uh, whether Deborah, who said it, but kind of 21st century uh, solutions to uh, the needs of uh, kind of citizens, uh, maybe patients, rather than the, the kind of uh, early 20th century model. Is that fanciful or, or do, you, do you think this really is a, a kind of major shift, a transitional term is a question? Anybody want to have a go at that? Yeah. 
Ma, Ma has her hand up, David. It might have been for the. Oh, I'm so sorry, Ma. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realise I muted. Yeah, it, it was for the um, the last question. I guess I was just looking at the the agenda and uh, and and the reading the words health and social care. But I, I then kind of really I started thinking about kind of informal carers, people who are in a sort of a, in a care system, not by choice, but by situation, um, and and how kind of um, uh, creative health is also really important to, to support those in for that kind of network of um, informal carers to do the job that they're they've not had training for and they're, and they're struggling with and and um, they're sometimes known as invisible patients because of the, uh, the you know the crises that they find themselves in in as being in informal carers, but they don't have time or space to look after themselves because they have this other role of looking after the person that they're um, they're caring for. So so so, so that came um, uh, it, it, in, into my mind. But I also wanted to kind of mention it, it was. Um, or, or just anecdotally, I, I've worked, I was running craft workshops for a pain clinic in, in Thamesmead, and, and it was the day before the first lockdown of the pandemic, and I know I needed to kind of get materials for my craft group. So I, I went to Hobby Craft, I think in, in Sidcup, and already it was like 12 o'clock noon, and already the shelves were kind of looking a bit bare. And I got my stuff that I needed for the workshops. I came out, looked behind me, and there's a queue around the block, around um, Hobbycraft. And I was thinking, that must be the first and last time that I will have seen something like that. But there was this kind of understanding for people who had the resources and, and time that they knew they were going to go into isolation. So they needed to get stuff that would keep them occupied and keep them focused and give them some sort of stimulation. It's interesting. It does echo back, Marjorie, at your earlier comments about kind of the passivity of, of, of patients and actually the, the, the way that uh, individuals could be supported and encouraged to, to. I remember the photographs around of the Hobbycraft queues as well. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, Tracy, I don't want to pick on you, but you, you began with some really lovely stories of, of your own experience, your own sort of non NHS experience. And I don't know if you have anything you want to add, because we're going to start drawing this section to a close, and I wouldn't want it to have uh, denied you further, but I don't know if you want to say anything else. Yeah, I was just sort of thinking, how can we not commission this? How can it not be part of our toolkit? It's going back, I guess, to that idea of 21st century problems and solutions, isn't it? That when so much of what we're seeing is either caused by or exacerbated by loneliness and social isolation then um how can this not be part of what we do because the last thing we want to be doing is trying to treat some of this with pills it's actually about uh, building people's self-confidence giving them a purpose um and a belief in a future and i think um to a certain extent that's what people have almost lost they don't see themselves as being part of the world or part of the sustained future and they don't have that confidence and aspiration and and it's so it's sort of creating that that shared dream we talk about health being really 20 percent of what keeps people well don't we and and actually to a certain extent with some of these issues it's um it's probably less than even that but but what health does have is that really con good convening function actually and that um power to be able to just stop and think about the individual and what they need and maybe to shift direction. So from that perspective, health and commissioning has a great deal of power in a system. And so I think that we have a responsibility to pull creative health in. And I don't think we have the option not to. Thank you, Tracy. It's interesting and it echoes again, Deborah, back to you. This kind of uh, requirement for leadership across the, across the ecosystem. So look, in the last oof, couple of minutes of the panel session, before I hand across to uh, Alan Howarth, just to say, pull the strings together, has anybody got a single, 
So these are short recommendations they want to share with uh, people on the call uh, about what all we could do to embed creative health into social care and wider systems. Any single, I mean, you've said so much, um, you know, don't squeeze it too much, but if anybody feels there's a single recommendation, we really love to hear from you, anybody. Yes, Nesta, thank you. Um, I think one of the, the key issues with the NHS is around the, the targets that we have, the performance targets, the tier one targets, and the kind of, you know, e even in Wales, when we've got the long term aspirations and principles within the well-being of future generations, the scrutiny then is about your acute hospitals, your performance. So I think one of the things that, you know, really could shift things is around the performance outcomes. So shifting from tier one, very crude targets very number orientated and how we can then move it to more patient-centered, person-centered outcome frameworks. So looking at, you know, the wider determinants, looking at prevention and, and community and, and, you know, supporting people, you know, well and what matters to people. Um, of course, targets have, you know, are important, but are we measuring the, the right thing? And is the targets that we've got slightly perverse in regards to what we're trying to achieve in the longer term. Thank you very much, uh, Nesta. Uh, Deborah? Um, I think uh, in the cultural sector, and actually throughout the course of, of, of doing kind of creative health work and, and advocacy over the years, um, I think we have been conditioned to not be ambitious enough and not to ask, and especially when it comes to money and resources. So um, I think, in, you know, investing in infrastructure and capacity, expertise, knowledge is absolutely crucial for how this work will go for, because there it's just really simply there will be somebody to do it. And there's a huge learning experience for me working with Carol, who has a health planning background and my background is culture. When we put budgets together, Carol gives the budget and then I look at it and instinctively go, oh, how do we reduce that? How do we cut that? And that has been a huge learning thing for me is that how are we applying that same thinking to everything that we do in terms of limiting our, our um, uh, expectations and ambitions? For the work yes it, it, you know, it's that validity you you talked about it's uh it's legitimate and not discretionary you know, it needs to be embedded chain i think to complement um, what nesta just said around the targets we need to define the leadership we're expecting within our health and care systems um what we've been looking for and therefore appointing previously won't work if we're going to try and do this different way of working which we're all agreeing is necessary and we've got some great examples of leadership here but i wouldn't say it's representative of what we see across the whole of our health and care sector so how can we define and recruit and support the leadership in this bold ambition well said well said uh, jane thank you very much well look uh, can I thank all of your panellists and indeed those people who were uh, putting in uh, questions and comments in the chat for a really, really good and stimulating uh, session this morning. But I want now to hand over to Lord Howarth, who's chair of NCCH and co-chair of the APPG on arts, health and wellbeing. So he's been a passionate advocate for creative health for many years, and he'll close the session with a with a summary, I think, Alan, of today's session. Thank you very much. How could I possibly summarize such a wide ranging, explorative, uh, inspirational uh, discussion that, as we've had this morning? Marvelous presentations. Thank you so, so much to everybody who's, who's contributed. And thank you, David. You yourself are a leader. You've given an amazing amount of time and energy to a variety of leadership roles in the NHS, but as I know from a number of years of experience and knowing you personally, you've had a sustained commitment to, to the Creative Health Project. So thank you for that and thank you for being an exemplar. And all of our speakers this morning have demonstrated exactly that, that 
sustained personal commitment. And that, of course, is an indispensable uh, feature of, of leadership. But we've also been reminded that leadership is not something top down. Leadership has to, has to be universal. Leadership has to be, as Carol put it, collaborative and, and distributed. And, the, and, and as Ma uh, put it to us so powerfully, the leadership of people with lived experience is probably the most instructive and informative uh, leadership that we can hope for. And we must ensure that in all that we do and in all that we seek to achieve in terms of transformation of existing systems, the voice uh, and knowledge of people with lived experience really has the opportunity to be brought to bear and to be influential and not just to be acknowledged as a matter of form, but to be respected and heeded and learnt from. Um, we have to change the way people think. And Tracy showed us in a way how this can be done by telling stories. I think always leadership is in part at least uh, a process of telling stories creating a vision, creating inspiration that challenges people's imagination. Because in the discussion we've had about how we develop 21st century ways of addressing the challenging issues of healthcare, the challenging issues of how to, how to form a society that itself generates good health rather than ill health, that we know that uh, people have got to think differently. And that is the most painful and difficult thing to do. Again, Ma, I thought very valuably, reminded us of the etymology of the word patient and the model that the word patient presupposes, which is the model of the clinical expert, the greatly respected and revered doctor figure acting upon a passive patient. And actually in the modern democratic world, and in the world that uh, our experience of creative health is teaching us that we can bring into being, patients must have agency. And if patients are to be well, they're not going to be made well. They're not going to be made completely and fully well. At any rate, they may be repaired, but they won't be, they won't be released into a fuller, healthier life if they merely take pills or follow instructions. They need to be agents and through their own personal creativity, they can be agents, and the system ought to support that. Uh, Jane, you spoke with all the passion and knowledge that you have from all your years of working in this, in this field about the need to shine a light on the potential of creative health. Well, that's what people have been doing this morning, but that is the challenge for us to ensure that that light is, is seen and recognized by vastly greater numbers of people and to achieve new recognition from the stories, from the way that light is shone is not going to be easy, but it's happening. It's happening cumulatively. And of course, we're impatient. We're very impatient and rightly so. And the crisis of the NHS justifies impatient and radical approaches. Um, so that uh, we have, as, as Jane, you yourself said, to work strategically and collectively across the system as a whole, energizing our health, care, health and care and creative workforces because they are exhausted. Uh, they are burnt out, as Nestor also told us. And through the practice of creativity themselves, they can be restored and revived in some considerable measure. But I think also through the vision of a system that's informed by creative health, they can, they can have new hope and new energy. And so that is absolutely crucial. Deborah talked of daring to be bold and talked again of altering mindsets of, of, the, of, of, of the necessity of flexibility, innovation. And Deborah and Carol both talked about how that uh, that, that inspiring rallying call has to be matched by a very practical, grounded focus on helping people develop the new skills that we need. And, um, 
as Deborah also said, said at the end, we have to be ambitious in our demands because we're not going to achieve the rebasing of skills. We're not going to achieve the multiplication of opportunities for creative health without more funding. And we must be very insistent that that should be forthcoming, what, however difficult an ask it may be. Nesta, you showed us that Wales is a beacon. I know that in Wales, you're no, not any, any longer allowed to refer to beacons in the English language, but um, Wales is a beacon. And it was extremely helpful to be reminded of what the elements of that success and that achievement have been. Again, very much about personal leadership. You at the, at the Welsh NHS Confederation, colleagues at the Arts Council of Wales, uh, personal leadership and partnership sustained over many years and developed within the within the, the incredibly valuable legislative context of the well-being of future generations act which places a legally binding duty on all the participants to develop common purpose to work inclusively and to think about the long term this is really this is really a model for how we should develop policy in this country. There's much debate and talk about it in Parliament. Uh, so far, the project for, for a, a, an English well-being of future generations uh, act has not prospered very much, but it is under discussion. And I think it's a sign of some promise, some promise for the future. And again, Nesta, you helpfully brought us back down to earth with, with a, a recommendation that we redefine performance targets. And, uh, and Jane, you said we must redefine, as it were, you didn't use this phrase, but the job description for leadership. Um, and I think, I think both those things are right. I hope that the Creative Health Associates Programme, which uh, National Centre for Creative Health is working on with the, with, with the Arts Council and with the NHS, will enable us to begin to develop roles perhaps to match those of the arts and health coordinators in Wales, and that we will be able to move towards what's been achieved in Wales, which is the development of an arts and health service within the health boards there. Um, and you also reminded us, Nestor, of the importance of going with the grain of the agendas that people hard pressed working on, on uh, urgent problems in the health service have to deal with, particularly uh, hospital discharges, and creative health can make a real, a real, a real difference there. But um, going back to general practice and communities, Shenaz, it was just magical. It was amazing to hear what you what you had to, what you had to say, and you, as an experienced, committed practice manager, have shown the originality and the courage to address problems differently. And in what you described to us, it's evident that what you sought to do has been more than, more than vindicated. Um, Matthew, thank you also for explaining to us the necessity of sustained commitment in your own case over, over 20 years. And Jane for emphasizing like, like Ma did, the importance of co-production. Finally, finally, last word from me. Um, it was inspirational to, to listen to Safing Service, a wonderful poem about what great leadership means, including essentially compassion, feed me art and not too much medicine, see art as a meditative space with all, with all the benefits that come from that, including wonder and happiness, so salutary, so health-giving. So thank you everyone for a, a great creative morning and the NCCH and our, our commission review process uh, will have learned a very great deal that's going to be a great value and I hope you will feel that the recommendations we in due course make justify the time and the energy and the imagination you've shared with us this morning. Thank you.